Hi class, today we're going to talk about our final review. So first I'm going to give y'all kind of a rundown on um, some of the things that are happening with the final. So the final is going to be um, three hours long. With additional time to scan and upload, um, you'll see on the actual document when I set it up, how much time I'm probably going to give you all 10 or 15 minutes to scan and upload everything. And again, um, like all other tests, if you have an issue and something's not working and it times out on you, just shoot me an email with it. Um, don't take like an additional two hours when you shoot me the email. That won't be okay. It's got to be decently quickly after with your exam and try to have the PDF name, your actual name, so that when I um, am grading, I know whose it is once I've downloaded them. Okay, so it's three hours long and it's going to be this on Monday or Tuesday of finals week. It's gonna be very similar to the midterms where you open it um, any time during those two days and you just get to use that three hour chunk to take the exam. Once you open it, you have to finish it. It's not like you can open the test, take a break in the middle and then finish like a couple of hours later. Okay, and I think it's going to be about 15 problems. It's not gonna be any more than 15. Um, and about half will be on chapter 10. And when we go through chapter 10, I'll tell you more about what it's gonna focus on. And then the, and then about a quarter, chapter three and a quarter, chapter four. And I'm still gonna run through some of the topics on um, things that we've covered, but if you want a good sense of problems um, that I'll probably go over, look at your first two midterms to get a sense of the type of problems I'm gonna ask. They probably won't look too drastically different. I'm not gonna throw a weird curveball at you right here at the end. So now let's get into the actual review. So we started with chapter three, which was with polynomial roots. and graphing. This was the heaviest graphing section that we had in the class. So with that, one of the real important things that we learned was that the real roots of a polynomial, they are equivalent to the x-intercepts on a graph. So when you find the roots of a polynomial, that lets you know the x-intercepts when you're graphing it. So when you are graphing, you need to be very clear about where your x-intercepts are. We also learned about the division algorithm. For polynomials, so that's if we have a polynomial p of x, it can be written as, oops, q of x, times d of x plus r of x, where the degree of r of x is less than the degree of d of x. So you're able to rewrite polynomials in this way, and the way that we found the remainders were often with the methods of long division and synthetic division. And so if we remember, if we have long division, so for an example, if we have x cubed minus 4x plus 3 divided by uh, x plus 1, if we were doing long division, we would write it as x plus 1, x cubed minus 4, or actually we'd include a 0, x squared minus 4x plus 3. 
So this is long division and then synthetic division, we would do minus one, because remember we need to take, when it's in this form, it's X minus C. So here it's minus minus one to get that plus one. With the coefficients listed, so one, zero, minus four, three. So these are what the two systems look through and you'd be able to solve and find the remainder and our quotient. All right. And then from there, we had two important theorems. We had the rational roots theorem. And this was very important. This let us know the possible rational roots of a polynomial and how to check them. And then we also learned about Descartes' rule of signs. And this is where we had p of x equals a naught plus a one x all the way to a n x to the n. And we looked at the changes in sign if there were any between coefficients. And that would let us know the positive, the number of possible positive roots. But we also needed to look at p of negative x and do some calculations there to find the possible number of negative roots. All right, and then after that, we learned about complex roots. So this is where we learned how to completely factor. So when I ask for y'all to completely factor, including complex roots, you need to write it, like let's say if we have x minus four, and x plus 3i, x minus 3i. I would want it written like this if I'm asking for it completely factored. I don't want it as x minus 4, x squared plus 9. I'd like this factored into its complex roots when asked for completely factored. A couple people made that mistake on the midterm, and I just wanted to kind of readdress it before the final. All right, and then we learned about the multiplicity of roots. So for example, if we had x minus four squared, x plus three cubed, x minus one, we would have four multiplicity two, negative three, multiplicity three and one, multiplicity one. This lets us know how many times it appears in our factorization of our polynomial. All right. And then we also learned about rational functions. And this is where we did I would say the most of our graphing and where our graphs started to become the most complicated. So the importance about rational functions is they look like P of X over Q of X, where P of X and Q of X are polynomials. So with this, <clears throat> we are able to find asymptotes, and those can be vertical, horizontal, or slant. A lot of people didn't understand the slant problem on the first midterm, so y'all might want to go through and review the notes on that, and there was a couple homework problems as well, if you feel like you didn't understand it in the first um, midterm. And then we also learned about polynomial and rational inequalities. Okay, and the biggest thing I saw with this was y'all would take something of the form like x squared plus 3x minus 2. 
We're actually, mm, you know what I'm actually gonna do is plus two over, I don't know. I'm just kind of pulling this one out at random. So we'll do, I don't know, x cubed plus x minus three. Sure. So <clears throat> what people would do here, oh, greater than or equal to, let's say seven. They would multiply this over and you can't do that in these problems. You can't be multiplying or dividing things out because you're not sure when something might be zero. And that'll really drastically change the problem. Instead, the procedure you were supposed to use was mostly subtracting. Minus seven is greater than or equal to zero. And then you would take this and you'd make a common denominator and then you would resolve for when it was greater than or equal to zero because it's an equivalent problem. And multiplying by one is different than like multiplying on both sides of the equality. So that's why you're allowed to make the seven have a common denominator. But yeah, you can't just multiply the denominator over to the other side and then solve for just the numerator. It gives you a very different answer. All right, now is the last thing we really talked about in chapter three. So now moving on to chapter four. This was with logs and exponentials. Actually, one last thing before I move on to this. When y'all are graphing your asymptotes, I want you to be very careful and make sure that your graph does not cross where you have a vertical asymptote or touch it. Cause that's the whole point of the function is that it never actually reaches there. So if you have it crossing or touching, it's not exactly right. So just be careful when you're graphing. All right. So now continuing with logs and exponents, we learned about compound simple interest which looks like a of t equals p times one plus r over n in t and compound, con con um, sorry, continuously compounding interest. And that looked like a of t equals p e r to the t. Okay. We also learned how to change between the logarithmic form and the exponential form. Oh, whoops. I forgot a bit. There we go. So you need to remember that log base A is the inverse of the exponential with base A. So when you're looking at a log problem, your output is the power in which you need to raise A in order to get X, which is what this is over here. Y is what you need to raise, have A raised to in order to get X as your output. So you need to be very comfortable in switching between these two forms. And you also need to be um, comfortable and familiar with log properties and exponential properties. And this is just kind of knowing that like log of one equals zero, log base a of a equals one, things like that. a to the zero equals one, a to the one equals a. You can kind of see how they mirror each other with the exponential form. Let's make this a log based A just for consistency. And then a very big and important part of the understanding logarithms was the law of logs. So this is very important. And this is if we have log of A plus log of B, that is the same as log 
log of a b log of a minus log of b is log of a divided by b and log of a raised to the c this is c times log of a okay and something else that i saw pretty frequently was if we had something like log of 3t squared. 3t squared does not equal 3 all of 3 of t, the entire thing squared, because this equals 9t squared. So be careful when you're looking at your order of operations with inside of log. Similarly, log of 3t squared like this, this does not have the same property where this 2 comes down because the 2 is outside. We only get to do it when our it's log of something raised to a power. So just be careful. These things are not equivalent. So just be careful with your order of operations so you don't make any small mistakes. <clears throat> and we also learned how to solve for x with log and exponential equations. All right, and there were several different methods that we used in class, just kind of review them before the test. Um, it's going to be similar to the kinds of problems that you saw in the second midterm. It's not going to be anything too crazy. And then also, when you're doing for this, you need to double check domain. Oops. That's very important. A lot of people forget to double check that. All right, and now we're moving on to chapter 10, which is with systems of equations and matrices. So this is what a good 50% of the test is probably gonna be on because it's our newest material and I'm gonna make sure you understand it. So the first thing we learned was the substitution and elimination methods. All right, and so we also learned about the possible number of solutions of a linear system. So with this, we need to recall that there was three options and there could only be one of them. So there's exactly one solution. No solution. And infinitely many solutions. And with this infinitely many, an important note, this does not mean all solutions. It just means that there's an infinite number of solutions of a particular form, which is why we often have that tuple thing. So we might have something like for example, minus 3t, t minus 1, and t, something like this with our parameter. So there's, because there's, for t and the real numbers, since there's an infinite number of real numbers, we have an infinite number of choices for t. So that's how we have an infinite number of solutions, but it is not every solution. Okay. We also learned what it means to be linear.
we only have the tools to solve linear systems. We don't know how to solve nonlinear systems in this class. And a very, very important part of this class is how to create a system from a word problem. This is very important and is very, very likely to show up on the final. All right. And we learned ways to simplify systems into triangular form. Okay, and I'm going to do a kind of example of what I think is a very good procedure. A lot of people had some questions in office hours. So let's say we had x plus y plus 2z equals 1, x minus 3y plus z equals 0, and x plus 0y minus z equals 3. So let's say we have this system. I think that the best way to solve a system like this to make sure that it's consistent is you start with this top x. Actually, I'm going to make this one a, a 2x just to make it a little nicer. So I'm going to use this top x to systematically eliminate these two x's in the bottom two equations. So in doing so, I'm going to do the calculations on the side, but I'm going to minus equation one minus two equation one. All right, so first I'm going to show, I'm going to take equation two, which is x minus three y plus z equals zero. And now I'm already going to multiply equation one by negative one so I can then add. So minus x minus y minus 2z equals minus one. And be very careful to also, whatever scaling you do, you also need to do on the constant on the right side of the equal sign. So now when we add, we're gonna get a zero x minus four y minus z equals negative one. Okay, and now I can rewrite the system and you leave the first equation alone and you replace the second equation. Okay, and now I'm going to do this minus uh, two equation one calculation. So first we take this third equation, 2x plus zero y minus z equals three. And we're gonna take this top part, we're gonna, we're gonna scale it by negative two. So negative two x minus two y minus four z equals negative two. And now we're going to add. So we get a zero x, a minus two y, a minus 5z equals 1. And so now we rewrite the equation again. So I kind of keep it in these two columns where I keep the system on the left side and all of my scratch work on the right. And I keep the, what I'm doing kind of next to the systems. Organization can be very key in, in these problems because there's so many parts to it. You don't want to misplace anything you're working with. Okay, and now I'm going to, I think it would be easier to work with the smaller coefficient of y. So I'm going to switch the order of these rows. And that's fine, that's one of our legal operations we can do with systems. So we have an x plus y plus two z equals one. I'm also going to multiply it by negative one just to make it a positive number. Then we have two y plus five z equals negative one. And I'm gonna do a similar thing with this equation. 
I'm going to multiply it by negative 1. So 4y plus z equals 1. Okay. And now I'm going to use this 2 to eliminate the 4y. So to do that, I need to subtract 2 of equation 2. So we rewrite it as 4y plus z equals 1 minus 4y minus 10z equals 2. So now simplifying, we get 0y minus 9z equals 3. And then as we rewrite the system, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to multiply by negative 1 third just to get rid and make it a little simpler. Actually, might as well just do 1 ninth, get that z just with the 1 in front of it. So rewriting the system, we have x plus y plus 2z equals 1, 2y plus 5z equals negative 1, and z equals negative 1 third. So now, and it's also okay that we're getting a fraction like this. Also, this problem might be a little messy right towards the end just because I wrote it at random and didn't do any pre-checking. But now we're going to use back substitution to solve. So plugging z equals negative one third into the top equation, we have 2y plus 5 times negative one third equals negative 1. So 2y um, minus 5 thirds equals negative 1. If we add 5 thirds to both sides, we get 2y equals, if we add that to both sides, this is. This will give us two thirds. And now we're going to divide two from both sides. We get y equals one third. Okay, and now we're going to use both of these and plug into the top equation. So x plus one third plus two negative one third equals one. So we have x plus one third minus two thirds equals one. X minus one third equals one. So X equals four thirds. So our final answer is four thirds, one third minus a third. So that's a review of how to do one of these system problems. I wanted to run through it with a little slower and showing all the steps because I felt like um, my lecture might not have been quite as clear as I wanted it to be. So I wanted to do a quick review before the final to make sure you all really understood how to do it. Okay, so simplify. Okay. We also learned how to convert a system into an augmented matrix. So if I use the system I had up here again, actually, I'm just going to kind of make up a new one because it's not a huge deal. So if we were to rewrite this as an augmented matrix, we would just take the coefficients. So 1, 2, 3, negative 3, 0, negative 1, 2, negative 1, 4, 1, 5, 0. So this would be our augmented matrix. And we also learned how to reduce one of these matrices into the triangular form that we talked about in lecture. And that's in a very similar way as the system. It's just a little nicer because you're not having to rewrite the X's, Y's, and Z's. But you do, I would recommend doing a very similar thing where you keep your matrix computations on one side and then all your scratch work on another and systematically eliminate things from the columns. Okay. And we learned the definition 
of row echelon and reduced row echelon. All right, so row echelon looked something like one, one, I need to put things in it. One, two, four, seven, nine, zero, one, three, negative one, seven, zero, zero, one, maybe a zero again, two, and zero, 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 one. Let's make this a five. So this is row echelon because you see above our leading ones, we have values that aren't zero versus a reduced row echelon form. What I'm going to do, I'm going to write this one as a dependent system just so you guys get a sense of something different we can do. Okay. So in this one, we still have our leading ones, which I'm going to circle. But every other entry in the column besides that leading one is a zero. And then we have this one free column with no leading one. So this implies we have infinite solutions and we are dependent on, this one would be Z where you'd make it z equals t for some parameter t and you solve the same way. Okay. And then we learned how to add, subtract, and multiply matrices. We also learned when we can do this, not just how, because there has to be certain conditions um, with their dimensions that match up so that we can do some of these and you need to know when that is. We also learned how to find the inverse of a two by two matrix. So this is so let A, B, A, B, C, D. Then A inverse is one over the determinant of A, which is A, D minus C, B. And this is where we switch A and D. And then we negate B and C. And this only works a inverse exists if, or I shouldn't use that shorthand with y'all, if, and um, actually, I'm just going to use arrows. I feel like a lot of pre-calc students prefer that. If and only if AD minus CB does not equal zero. So, and then we also learned how to find the determinant of a matrix up to a three by three. And I'm gonna let you guys know right now, there will definitely be a determinant of a three by three problem on your final. It's very common, it's very likely. Um, and then I might ask you the criterion for if that matrix is invertible or not. And we know that by the invertibility criterion. What this says is A, a matrix A, is invertible. This means that the determinant of A 
does not equal zero. That also means it's equivalent to if the determinant of a equals zero, then a is not invertible. So while I will not ask y'all to find the um, inverse of a three by three or higher matrix, I might ask y'all to tell me if it is invertible or not, because that's a very fair game. It depends upon the determinant of a matrix. And um, so while I'm not going to give y'all a bunch of determinant or inverse problems, I will have a question or two on the final for it. Um, just because they're, they're good questions to ask and they really get you to think and use all your problem solving skills that you've developed all quarter. All right, I think that is really everything that we learned this quarter summed up. So good luck on your final.